Uh, thanks for joining everyone. So I'm Elena Hayes. I'm Senior Director of Life Design for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I have the fantastic privilege of um, leading a wonderful team called SOAR, Seizing Opportunities, Access, and Relationships. And they are all working diligently to support our first-gen and limited-income students and uh, creating opportunities to connect with with alumni, with employers, with supporting, navigating life design decisions. So thrilled to be with you all today and engaging in the conversation. Clifton, you wanna go ahead? Yes. Hello everyone, I am Clifton Chambry. I am uh, one of the life design educators on the SOAR team. Uh, my portfolio encompasses working with our uh, diversity and inclusion offices on the Homewood campus, so that includes the Office of Multicultural Affairs, Women and Gender Resources, LGBTQ Life, and Religious and Spiritual Life. Hi, y'all. Um, my name is Emily Hickey. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I work very closely with Clifton uh, under the umbrella of diversity and inclusion, um, specifically in multicultural affairs. So my role there is to lead diversity education efforts um, and support all international students. And I am uh, very happy to be having this conversation today. Ready to jump for great. Well, Clifton, maybe if you want to first start by uh, sharing the the quote and yes. uh, and then also introducing, I think we have our famed author on yes. online as well. So that would be fantastic. Yes. So one of the articles that we wanted to share um, was done by an alum, Sarwa, um, and so this article was done. Um, May 30th, and she shared it with me, and I was grateful that she shared it with me because, as we all know, there we're in very different times uh, for a lot of reasons. And so, um, Sarah Wah is actually on the call with us today and shared this article with us. Um, and I am just wanted to discuss one of the quotes from the article. There's a lot, and I will share this link in the chat um, so that you all have it. But there's a lot that is really digging deep into an experience that folks are having in this day and time. Um, and this quote specifically tied, touched my heart a little bit and really thinking about a black person is dangerous in America, not because of what we do, but what can be done to us. Um, and so that is something that I want us to really think about right now and just sit with that for some time um, and process that like that what does that mean to us? What do we think initially when we process that? Um, and I don't know, maybe we want Sarawa to, you know, talk a little bit about why that quote was important for her to address in that, in this article specifically um, for like a minute or two, if you wanted to join us and you can do that. Uh, but uh, Elena, Emily and I are going to share our own thoughts about it as well. Uh, but it'd be great if we could have the author share a few, a few minutes about her experience. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the uh, introduction and for sharing my article today. Um, I'm a recent alumna of Hopkins who just graduated this May, um, and I wrote this article um, in reaction to everything that was going on. It was just so much that I needed to write in has been one of the ways that I sort of cope and let my feelings out. So um, when I wrote this article and I, when I wrote this specific quote, um, I was just thinking of how the media tends to portray Black bodies so often in movies, in news, um, in television, everything. It seems like the Black person is always the aggressor, always the perpetrator. Um, but I think more and more we're realizing that, you know, the, our, the color of our skin isn't what makes us dangerous to other people. In fact, it makes us, uh, like, our existence is dangerous because of what can be done to us because of um, factors that have to do with structural racism that has seeped into multiple facets of society, including law enforcement, health, um, et cetera. So that's why I wrote that specific um, line. Um, yeah, it's just like something that I've really felt and I felt it was something that has to be said. And there's probably a lot of people that said the same thing, but it was a way for me to, you know, get my feelings out about how I felt on what's going on following Ahmad, George, and Brianna. Thank you for sharing. 
and, and being bold actually to actually share your experience so publicly, right? Um, as you are navigating this experience that you have, uh, that we share in a sense. Um, one of the biggest things that also kind of <laughs> um, touched me when I heard it from a, a friend of mine is that they said that someone asked them, could you provide me, they were in work and that the person asked them, can you provide me this report by the end of the day? And the response of the person was, um, I just experienced a lynching, but yes, I can get you it by the end of the day. Uh, and so like that is pretty, a, a, a really awesome experience that, you know, you were able to do this and publicly share with the world. Um, it's not awesome about the opportunity that we had to experience to actually share this, this uh, have you have the, your gift shared with the world. Um, so yeah, I think that this is something that I am personally sitting with um, to the fact of how can I go outside, right? Um, can I walk outside freely? Don't feel so, right? Um, shared with some friends about a protest that happened yesterday that I couldn't actually, I didn't feel like I could walk outside by myself to the protest to possibly find them, right? That is an experience that I, I might be blowing it out of proportion, but that's, that's I feel that way. Um, and so that's something that like this quote, that you provided continue to come to the mind. Like I'm thinking about what can be done to me just by walking outside or not even walking outside. So, um, and I'm, I'm really grateful to have a, a workspace that allows me to share my experiences and to just talk about it, right? Um, I luckily have a supervisor that is a, a woman of color, black woman, Elena, really grateful for her. But yes, it's, it's also great to have other colleagues and allies like Emily, Hickey, and Dolphins Multiple Experience that are really being bold and really saying what needs to be said and doing the work that needs to be done to help folks realize that this is not just a part of one, per one person's identity. It's everyone's responsibility to think about how do we support each other. And I just want to echo your comments so much of what you, what you said. And Sirwa, thank you for, again, sharing your perspective. I couldn't agree more, and I literally just said this uh, in my previous meeting, um, but, and this is, I think, kind of the point of this conversation, or one of the points of this conversation, and hopefully a take-home point for students who are, or, you know, recent alums, or just anyone, as you're navigating this experience, whether you are a person of color, or you're an ally of people of color, thinking about you know, where you spend your time from a work perspective and how so much of what your experience is going to fill into your work experience and that you have to be in a place that's going to be supportive of your identity, that's going to, and support can look different for everyone, but I think it's even going beyond support. Someone who's a, a place that's going to advocate for your identity. When we decided to, to have this conversation, I didn't think twice about if it was okay for us to have this conversation. That wasn't a question. I literally said to Clifton, this is timely. This is something that we need to talk about. What do you think about doing it? He was on board and that was it. I didn't go to senior leadership to ask if that was okay. I didn't check and make sure that it was fine. I knew that it was. And I think that's an important piece that you have to think about. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful to be in an institution where that is what we have the ability to do. That not only did I know it was okay to do it, but I knew that we would be supported to do it. And now I was surprised to see the, the, uh, the support of it for, in terms of everyone wanting to attend, which I think is fantastic. But it also, you know, I think is, is uh, a, a testament to the people that you work with and the people that we work with. And so I'm, I'm very thankful to have that um, as an opportunity. And then to know that we could leverage, you know, Emily and, and tap into her for her perspective um, and her willingness to, to participate. But I certainly am in the, uh, in the same space in that it's challenging right now as, um, as a Black woman to to think about, you know, even, I think that sometimes the experience that we have, um, other, other races, other perspectives may not see, like if it didn't happen to you directly, you may not see how does this, I never knew George Floyd or Ahmaud or anyone, but, but it is, you begin to question your own, why don't I matter? You know, why does it, because it could be me, it could be my brother, it could be my dad, you know, and so just the, you start to question your own worth 
um, because you are you know how much you're adding to the world and to society and you know certainly the need for your reporting and the numbers and the data that you can produce but like do you care about me um, do you care about my existence I think is a huge is a huge piece of it as well so I'm really thankful that we can have this conversation today um, Yeah, and I'm uh, incredibly grateful to be a part of this dialogue. I think, uh, you know, the intersection of the conversation is critical, um, particularly given Hopkins. Um, you know, thinking about Sirwa's quote, uh, the very first reaction I had um, after reading the article is that white folks are who's dangerous. Like white, you know, we don't need any more headlines or stories or data to know how dangerous white folks can be, uh, which I think is why having conversations, particularly about navigating workspaces with black coworkers, given how much tragedy and how much pain has been suffered in this country, you know, 400 years ago and yesterday. Um, it's critical that these conversations continue to happen. Uh, and I'm very, very grateful uh, that, you know, Hopkins provides the opportunity to do so. Um, yeah, we got a lot of work to do. So I think you, you left, I think, on a, on a great note in terms of we have a lot of work to do. Right. So, you know, as we are thinking about working with each other in the workspace, and you know in our environments what's the first step you know what do we how do we how do we what is that work that we have to do and how do we do it from you know being a person of color but also being an ally of people of color you know i know for me i think that uh it's challenging sometimes to have to be the the guidance and the reference and the source of information all the time too you know as much as i want to be um encouraging to my white colleagues to take on learning about this i also don't want to have to carry the burden of teaching you either um and so i think that you know kind of finding that balance of of support versus doing your own work in terms of, in terms of um, getting the information that's, that's so necessary. So I'm just curious from, from your perspective and Clifton as well, what are, you, what are your thoughts on what, what do we do? How do, what's the steps? What are the steps? Um, you know, particularly from a, a white lens when talking about like racial justice or conversations on race, particularly in the workplace, uh, white folks need to talk to white folks you know, to remove some of the burden and the um, racial battle fatigue that communities of color feel day to day. I mean, there's a lot of, um, and that's kind of what I'm referencing in terms of a lot of catching up to do. I think within white communities, it is not normal for folks to talk about race. Uh, you know, I've started doing it with uh, my parents and I can see like visible discomfort, but that's where the critical work takes place. You know, we dismantle from the inside. So that's why those conversations need to happen, um, particularly so that, you know, folks who hold positions of privilege around race can know how to affirm and support, you know, the people that they care about or work with. I really agree with what Emily just said um, about educating, like, each uh, especially in the white community because I went to predominantly white school and um <laughs> I remember so uh, so part of my a push um class we run for like presidency like big presidency and I was a vice president for a white president candidate and <laughs> I remember one day we went to one of the rooms and we were discussing racism we're talking about like race the topic of race and the, I forgot what the question was, but they asked him how he would combat a problem that has to do with race um, issues. And he was like, racism doesn't exist. <laughs> like, we, they, there's no racism in the U.S. And there were actually multiple other students um, that I had talked to at this school that felt the same. And like Emily was saying, like, when you are in a place of privilege and you're surrounded by 
most likely like-minded people like it's hard for you to realize that there are people that are suffering like you're not living in those neighborhoods like for example like all anything like police brutality we only see like probably like 10 percent of what's actually going on because george floyd it just so happened that someone was there with a phone to capture that there's probably a hundred other deaths that have never been captured and there's so many things going on around us that if we're we continue to live in a bubble and we refuse to have this conversation about how real racism is for a lot of people it's going to be very hard for us to evolve and actually get somewhere and have this conversation be fruitful yeah i agree with what you all said and I, i'm one of the things that i've been processing is when someone asks me, you know, how could they help? Uh, that's a very interesting question during this time period. It's, and my response immediately is in my head, I don't know, right? Um, because this is something that is just hard to manage and navigate and to figure out what can be done to make a change is, there's a lot of things, right? Um, and one of the things that I really appreciated was what someone from uh, one of my previous people that I was engaged with um, from college, they literally text me recognizing that something is going on and that I might be working through it, right? And to figure out how to navigate it, not assuming anything and just recognizing that something is happening in our world. And I know that it possibly could be tough, right? And then they said, I am going to be praying. Are there things that I could pray for you, right? And that was a direct way that I could respond and I could say, yes, here are some things, right? Um, so that's what I, I think is helpful is that if there are direct ways that you know you serve best, may maybe offering those opportunities. And then the individuals can then say, you know what? I actually, not that, not right now, or you know what, that'll be great, right? That is one thing that I found very, very helpful in this time. And Clifton, I like um, that you brought up, um, you know, how to help, but then also like navigating space, uh, because particularly thinking about navigating, um, working with black coworkers space, and time are very, very precious and something that needs to be honored. Um, Alina, I think in the beginning, you had talked about like the fatigue of like teaching and dialoguing and, you know, helping people move through things. Um, and so we would be, uh, it wouldn't be right if we didn't bring up the guilt that comes with, um, you know, privilege of being white or white passing when engaging in these spaces. Uh, because oftentimes that guilt when not explored or processed through can, you know, lead into like tokenizing our colleagues of color um, and asking them for the things that would be really helpful in these moments when in the rea when in reality, we should be talking with other white folks about what white folks can do to show up, right? Like relieving some of that um, work and burden um, that's been around. I also want to take a minute to, if it's okay, shout out another great author that we have on uh, on the call today. Elise did a fantastic article on uh, through the newsletter. Uh, I don't know if you're comfortable. If you are, it would be great to hear just kind of some of your perspective and, and what you were feeling and thinking as you shared um, this space and, uh, you know, shared your thoughts. Hi everyone. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Um, thank you for having me. First of all, I'm really touched of not only the people who've reached out to me, but specifically administration. I think that's something um, I haven't seen in the past at Hopkins. And so I'm really happy to have a space where I can share my thoughts and know that it'll make an impact. But um, so I'm from Minneapolis. I'm also a black woman. And I think it was really important to me to write this article. Um, just because I think a lot of the people I'm surrounded with at Hopkins, like Sarah, I also grew up in a white affluent community 
don't look like me and also might not understand what I've been going through. And that's also been apparent with the responses I've gotten, such as I, I had no idea this was happening or, oh, like I've never thought of it through that perspective. And in a lot of these cases, I think, like you guys have said, that's kind of hurtful, but also like this needs to be said and like it needs to be done. So I, I knew that it was like, it, if I didn't do it, I don't think anyone else would have. So I'm glad that I was able to share my platform as painful as it was. Um, but in the article, I'm not sure if everyone's gotten to read it. I kind of talk about growing up mixed and having my um, white side of the family not understand or like the white friends I have around me not understand. And part of that is just trying to give a lens eye view of like Clifton said, like you're picturing it for yourself and you're picturing it for your family. And I think that's where a lot of people talk about, they don't understand because they're not able to be empathetic towards it. So this is kind of the perspective of like, if you know me and you know what it would feel like, then I hope you'd understand why it hurts so much or why it's so offensive, why it's so offensive when you post things about Trump on Twitter. And like all these things that are little things, but in the end they add up to a picture of just feeling unsafe and feeling hurt and feeling tired. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there's a specific part you guys wanted to talk about, but that's kind of the overall theme. No, I think that, that that's great. I'm just curious as you kind of think about um, your reflections and and this is this us being the life design lab and thinking about um you know how this transcends as you picture moving through the rest of your school career but also into your actual working career what are some things and i i feel like there have been so many also um uh posts and and you know every company is out here making a, a statement you know, uh, a letter or, you know, this is what we're doing. I'm curious as, as a student who's kind of looking to, you know, get into their career at, at some point, what are the things that you're, what are the cues I think that you're looking for to hear from maybe an organization or from um, a company or, you know, uh, even working with people that you're thinking about as like, this is what I need to hear, or this is important to me. Um, to think about as I, I make decisions for moving forward with my my schooling, but also my my career as well. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because another reason I'm happy that you guys were the ones who reached out is I think you guys can help make a difference for me and some of the other smaller communities I'm involved in at Hopkins. Um, and I'm just trying to scroll through the article to find a specific part, but. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to read a part of one of my paragraphs that talks specifically about the school. And so I say, we remember moments of power, such as the protests in the days following the murder of Freddie Gray, when we made our voices heard. At the student, sit, at the student run sit in last spring, we showed our administration that we would continue to stand up for those who were ignored regardless of their decision. And given the email we received Sunday from the University of President Ronald J. Daniels, it is time to hold them to this promise of promoting inclusivity and outreach in the, Baltimore, in the Baltimore community. Time and time again, they have failed to do so. As a member of both Hopkins Athletics on the women's basketball team and fraternity and sorority life in Phi Mu Gamma Tau, I hope my mentors and peers will stick up for me for this cause. And I think writing that, I really was trying to figure out how I wanted to address the university without kind of getting shut down or without it kind of being an attack towards past actions. But even in this week, as we reflect on how long, it's only been two weeks since the murder of, jo jo of George Floyd, I think it's important to recognize that the university will put out statements and sometimes like will do small actions to kind of quiet unrest. Whereas some of these, some of these actions need to be bigger than that. And I know my, my um, emphasis right now is just reaching out to both my sorority and also the athletic department and trying to establish clear bylaws of um, consequences of, of hate speech and of acts of ignoring like microaggressions. And so I would like to ask your guys' help of just, I think there needs to be some permanence in the decisions that are being made currently. And I think now is the time to do them while the momentum is still high. 
I couldn't agree more um, in terms of what advocacy in the workplace or even the, you know, the university or the college that you're in, um, policy is very important. Procedures are very important. Um, a lot of things can contribute to microaggressions and margin further marginalizing folks, right, that are behind the scenes, that are static. Um, there's a lot to do. I'm wondering if we want to pause and maybe take, um, we had talked about maybe taking questions from folks who are um, uh, on, uh, logging on today around, you know, uh, this conversation. If there are questions that people are thinking about as uh, whether they're navigating work as a black person or navigating working with black coworkers, you know, if there are thoughts or questions around that, that, that they're wanting to explore, would certainly be open to hearing those at this point. Guess either unmuting or dropping them in the chat box are, are good options for both of those. If we don't have questions, I'll just pose another question um, to, to everyone or, or to my fellow panelists, Clifton and Emily. Um, as you're thinking about kind of everything layered on that we've been dealing with. So first it's, it's COVID um, and obviously COVID having a different impact on um, the minority community as well and that having, you know, a, a significant um, issue uh, for, for everyone. Um, but then also, you know, the, the, uh, the killings of, of uh, George Floyd, um, Brianna, um, Ahmad, and all of the others that are kind of individual. Um, when you go back to work, whatever that is, whatever, uh, whatever that is, what are kind of the, 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 I guess, what's the, what's the way to show up at work? Um, I shared this with a, a uh, in the previous meeting, I have a friend who um, let me know about someone in their own workplace who came to work recently uh, wearing a um, Black Lives Matter t-shirt to work. And uh, within an hour though, they were seen having to, they were not wearing it anymore. So they were asked either to remove it or kind of directed that this is not the direction that we were going in, but whatever it, whatever it was, they were showing up as, as this, this is important to me. And then within um, you know, a very short amount of time, we're not able to wear it. So um, I'm curious for, for you all, um, you know, coming back into work whenever that is, how do you show up? How do you show up and be advocating for what's important to you? Um, it takes some. It takes some courage, you know. It takes some. Uh, uh, it definitely takes some courage, especially if you're not in an environment like where we are, where people are as supportive. So, how do you show up, and how do you 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 maintain that? Uh, dress code <laughs> is a great place to start, like what Elise had mentioned about evaluating policies or, you know, just thinking bigger and more structural. Dress code is the place to start. The amount of policing that happens depending on race, gender, sexual orientation, um, you know, a lot of folks see that as more passive work, right, because it's not upfront and in your face, but those are some of the structural changes that I think we can make. Um, a little bit more behind the scenes and things that can be done quickly, right? A lot of this 
there's a lot to undo. Um, so we need to move, uh, move quickly. So dress code that would allow opportunity for folks to voice their opinions uh, passively. And then, you know, um, art, you know, uh, universities and colleges like to put a lot of things on the walls. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, I would agree, I think um, somehow addressing the systems that are in place are going to be important. Yet for an individual aspect is knowing your space, right, and knowing your environment. Um, you oftentimes can see that without even, even showing up to a physical space, right? You can look at their website. You can be how they, how they interview you. All of that you can see what the environment might be um, for you to be able to know how you can express yourself, right? Um, and so I think knowing your environment is very important so that you can then know when you can and how you can act um, as in like advocate or at, be an activist for whatever cause you want to be an activist for or an advocate for. So I think that is really helpful to know that in advance um, so that you can then say, you know what, I know I, I'm showing up in this way might not be as accepted. Um, so how can I continue in this space? Like that's when you start also questioning, is this a space continuing that I can continue in or how long will I be here, right? Um, Cause that's also sometimes a necessity for, as I will say for me as a black man, I have to decide how long will I be here in this environment? Because I know that I can't continue in this environment for a lot of reasons. Um, or you know what, I can actually stay here because I see where I can make change, right? So I think that's where you have to also think about for yourself. I'm curious too, what type of, and this might be a good time, I know we've had some resources that were shared with us from um, uh, I think our counseling office, if I'm not mistaken, but this might be a good time to talk about some of the resources that are available to us um, as staff, but also for students, um, you know, kind of navigating this environment and, and everything that's going on. Um, do you want to drop those in? And I think we have, is it, is it Asia? Do you yeah. want to, uh, great. Sure. Um, sorry for joining late. We're trying to just navigate all good resources for our um, staff and faculty. So my name is Asia Corbett. I am a counselor with the Employee Assistance Program. Um, and that is a program that's available to all of our employees across the enterprise and their household family members. The beauty of my support is that we offer five free sessions per issue per year. Um, to our employees and their family members to get this kind of emotional well-being um, support. We have access to uh, maybe like 60,000 counselors nationwide. So you have the option to see a provider in the community, but also um, myself and my colleagues, some of us before COVID were on site. We're now doing um, telehealth sessions by uh, televideo and telephonically to be able to support our populations. Those from the on-site team, we are Johns Hopkins employees and we all are living in Baltimore or Maryland, so we understand the climate. Um, you also can get a counselor at 24 hours, 365, seven days a week by just calling that number there, 77,000. I just wanna point out that that number is also available to students, option one, is for our students, which is a different program. That's the student assistance program. Option number two is going to be our EAP. And then there's a whole slew of other resources that are available there. I will say my support is at the intersection of helping through wellness programming, as well as through family support programming, about how we really can use um, some wellness techniques as a healing property um, for our community. And so we're working on sleep as a tool for healing. I just got off an 11 o'clock call and the ideas were just coming at us. Art as a healing tool, yoga as a healing tool, because we recognize that this is very heavy for a lot of us, especially those of us that are having to deal with this on a daily basis in our daily lives, on a personal level, as well as professional. And so we wanna be the safe space where, uh, you know, we provide some healing techniques and some wellness tools, but this uh, service is available immediately 
And if anyone has any further questions, please reach out. If you're having these conversations and you need someone to come and help facilitate them, please reach out to us. We're here to support you guys. Thank you for having me at such short notice. Thank you. Um, I will just, I think, share just some resources that I think are helpful as well. I, I can't advocate enough for the use of, you know, counseling and, and mental health therapy um, services. <laughs> and I think the crazy thing is that in the Black community, that is often so shameful that you would leverage therapy. You know, I know just Historically, it's been like, well, we pray it away, or you don't, you go to church, you don't need therapy, you don't need, you know, mental health. That's for white people. Like, literally, that's not what has been um, uh, advocated for for us. But I'm happy to see that the stigma of that is, is slowly beginning to shift. And I think that, especially in these times, that's such an important piece because there's so much inside that needs to find a way out. Um, in a in a way that you can manage it because on top of dealing with these other feelings you know about the things that are happening in the world and our own black community you're also navigating just living like paying your bills maintaining your household did I eat right did I get the proper amount of sleep you know um, I know for me I'm in school right now so managing that on top of everything else so it's like so many different things um, to try to balance. And it's just too, I am not a good juggler, uh, too many balls in the air. And so being able to have and to be able to leverage mental health resources, I think are extremely helpful um, for everyone in this space and, and navigating those, those very, you know, challenging feelings and the ups, the ups and downs um, and the ebbs and flows that we feel in, in what's going on, I think is, is huge. So um, echoing what you said about wellness um, and what that advocacy can look like, you know, the self-advocacy, but then there's also things that if you're in a position of power or you lead a team or, you know, you're in one of those spaces that Clifton mentioned where you feel safe enough to bring and brave enough to bring up certain policies and suggestions. Um, something that I'm really curious about uh, and I don't have the answer for, uh, but if anyone has an HR background, chime in. Um, you know, thinking about supporting Black coworkers, particularly now, like today, tomorrow, yesterday, um, what does time off or away look like from an HR perspective? Could that be one of the ways that folks who carry a lot of privilege, you know, take on some of that weight so that folks can take care of themselves and, um, you know, find wellness uh, in whatever capacity they're able? You know, thinking about time off or away, um, you know, if that's not something that's possible in your area, maybe even rescheduling your meetings, because for anyone to go through a tragedy of any kind, right, whether it's personal, whether it's communal, whether it's national, regional, local, tragedy hurts. Um, you know, the pain is there, even if you're having a meeting, you know, about uh, an event or a program. Right, it's hard to do that business as usual uh, when you're in pain. So think about that, particularly from like workplace engagement, right? So even if we don't have the power to change HR policies, which would be very nice, um, even if we don't hold that power, we do hold the power over the schedule that we have, the meetings that we hold for our student orgs, for our departments. Um, and I would just really encourage you, that's something that y'all could do today with afternoon meetings, right, or tomorrow, um, to allow everyone time to rest. So I, I oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. You go ahead. I was gonna say, I heard something very interesting in a listening session that I was a part of yesterday. And the conversation was around like being approached by colleagues that aren't black to say, what can I do to help and support you? And it, the way she set up the analogy, the, the speaker was like, if you're in the house and your partner's there and you're juggling, like the dinner's boiling over, you have the, your phone in one hand, you have a laptop in one hand, you have a crying baby in the other hand, and you're just trying to dr juggle all that stuff and someone walks up to you and they say, what can I help you with? It's more taxing on us to say, 
actually my laptop's about to fall over or the dinner is boiling over. Can you get that? Then for someone just to say, let me take this off your plate. So it's a difference to say, are you sure you really want to have this meeting versus we're going to cancel this meeting because it seems like you have a lot on your plate and I know there's a lot that you can process. Let's just cancel our one-on-one -on -one, or let's just cancel our team meeting. Let's go away from week over week and go to bi-weekly or semi-monthly as a means to show up and say, here's the support that we're giving because it can be emotionally taxing to have to speak out and say, actually, this is what I need versus someone just offering something that could really give space for time and healing and, and that kind of thing. So I wanted to offer that because I thought that was very powerful. I, I can't stress that enough. I think that's a great suggestion because also I think that, so in addition to just trauma, I think that something to think about as a, as a, you know, a person of color, as a black woman, it has been instilled in me about work ethic and always doing well beyond probably, you know, what is normal or accepted for other, for other folks. And so I think that I would, I would never, you know, or the likelihood, I would say, that I would come and say, hey, I can't today because whatever. I'm always going to show up because I have the, the belief that it's important and I don't want anyone to question my not showing up and attributing it to being a Black person or the, you know, I feel the, you carry the burden and I don't think people realize this, but you carry the burden of being a good representative for Black people so that you can keep seeing more Black people being hired and Black people in, in places of leadership and getting that job opportunity. And so because you carry that burden, you are needing to perform so that it doesn't become an issue for someone else. You know, I look at, I, I, I take it very seriously and that I'm leading the path for someone else to come after me to get into that role. And so if you can just say, hey, let's, let's cancel for today, or I don't need to do this for today, or shift the meeting and say, you know what, let, I'm leaving some space if you want to talk, but if you don't, then it's okay. Like even doing that is, is fine. But I think that that's a, that's a big, that would be, that's a big deal. That probably goes a long way. Um, because of the responsibility and the likelihood of not saying no. Well, and so something you mentioned is, um, you know, this desire to not, um, you know, to continue to show up and be resilient and, you know, all of those things. So I would, I would say that, you know, if folks who are in positions of power that can make these decisions, or even if you're controlling your own meeting, you know, it's going to vary based on person and what's important to them and whether they want distraction or not. Um, but, you know, very seriously offering this as a space um, for folks, because I know I can imagine that there would be a lot of folks who would feel pressured to be like, no, let's just let's keep it on the schedule. Thank you for the offer. But no, thanks. So just reminding yourself that um, to truly show up and advocate for your black coworkers, um, particularly right now. Um, sometimes comes with just like continuing to provide permission to rest and to be and to go and to do. Um, you know, I know that's not going to be the case for everyone. Everyone and, hopes differently, but. And I would add to that, like, hopefully folks who are uh, non-Black have built relationships with their staff to know what they mean by when, when they say, no, I'm okay. Like we say things in certain, everyone says that we say things in certain ways for reasons, right? We have intonations of how we say things and how we process things. And you can read that if you have been able to work with your staff closely, right? You should be able to sense that. Um, and then you should be able to sense at a time when they're actually in a better place, right? Um, and or like folks have been suggesting, just remove the barriers and, and so that folks can deal with things. Um, and so like, I think it's a com com combination of how you can work with the people directly individually, because the resources we're sharing is not it's not for everyone, right? So you have to work with the people individually that you are working with to make sure that the experience that they are having is unique to them because it is their individual at first, right? Um, and so you can't approach everything with everything being the same thing. Like you have to go into an individual approach. Um, and so with that in mind, I think that uh, uh, someone was wondering about like, as a white person, um, how do they respond, right? How do they respond or do they not respond, right? 
um, especially for those who might be more seasoned white folks um, and really thinking critically about like, this might be the first time that they've seen it in this capacity or at, it might be the first time on their radar. Um, and so what does that mean for them to actually think about how they approach the people, the black people to talk to them? Um, and so I'll read a little bit more on the, so um, it is presumptuous to bring it up as in, oh, you're a black person, so you must want to talk about this. On the other hand, does not bring it up, does not bring it up, leave an awkward silence that implies that you don't actually care. Allyship is complicated. One simple um, way you can do is to, to open up and, and ask for permission, right? Like, is now a good time for us to have this conversation before just jumping right in? And I think that's with anything, kind of, if you look at it, like, from the lens of grief, right? You're not just going to jump in, like, do you want to talk right now about the loss of your loved one? You're going to ask for permission and see if it's an appropriate time for you to have that conversation. I'm sorry to cut you off, Emily. I just wanted to jump in there and say, just ask for permission and see if it's the best time first um, before just, just assuming that it's the right time. I'm so glad you brought up grief. Because I think that that can be... Um, a way to like hone in on some empathy in terms of what someone may be going through and something that can kind of help you manage like how you move forward. Um, something I might toss back to the person who asked the question is what is your intention for this dialogue? Is it for you to process your guilt? Is it because you really care about this person and you're concerned about their mental health and well-being? Is it because you need something from them, so you just want to get this conversation out of the way, right? Um, evaluating where your intention is coming from in terms of having some of these dialogues and conversations is the first place I would start. Uh, because, you know, no matter how well intended we may be, can't control a lot of the impact. So it's important that we do a lot of the work behind the scenes before we even engage so that it's not uh, reckless allyship or advocacy, you know, which could potentially do more harm than good. So I know I didn't answer the question directly, but toss it back. Well, we, I think we are running out of time and I think it's been really great sharing all of what you all have shared and learned and talked about um, and all of these great resources. I will say that we do want to leave time to like just reflect on what we've heard. Um, so if folks can take this time to just think about what you've heard, you've learned, you've gained. Um, and we will like you all to take action, right? And share what you've learned with others. One way we like you to share, if you're able to, is to share online, right? And so if you can share online, one thing you're taking away from this conversation on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, and use the hashtag NWN as a Nancy, WWB. Um, that would be great because then others can learn about what you've learned today um, and figure out how we can work together to move forward. Um, and so that's something that I would love to learn more from you all. And so we would follow along with that hashtag and continue the conversation with each other. Um, in addition, we have two other resources from the Office of Multicultural Affairs, of which they'll be conducting some sessions this week, so on Thursday. Um, and so, Emily, you can chat out these resources. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, while having conversations centered around racial justice and what that can look like, um, and even touching on to, uh, you know, uh, jumping off of the, the constant desire to want to help, this is where we're going to talk about it. This is the appropriate space to ask all your uncomfortable questions. We're going to provide you with a lot of resources in terms of what it looks like to be an ally for racial justice right now. Um, it's going to be in the workplace. We're going to talk about family. We're going to talk about student organizations, departments, offices, friends, um, because the work doesn't stop just, you know, it doesn't stop. So we have a session for students on Thursday, um, an early morning session and an evening session to accommodate the various time zones that our community is in, um, and also just energy if you're a morning person. And then on Friday, we're going to be hosting a session that is specific for Hopkins staff. Um, you can register through the links that are in these flyers. Um, Clifton, would we be able to share it with folks? Okay, 
great. So you can uh, register through those links. We have conversations on Thursday and Friday. It's going to be. Sorry, I, that's okay. I think that <laughs> this is going to be an ongoing conversation. Um, and I think that's also a very important part of this is that six months from now, we're still, we're still moving forward. There have been just some questions about sharing this. So we will be able to share this on our YouTube um, LDL TV on demand. So we'll make sure to make that available. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we're gonna look to put it on the My Support page as well, maybe. Um, so that would be great. We are, uh, I will say just my own reflections. I think I'm encouraged by the the willingness to participate in the conversation, the diversity across the screen participating in the conversation. I'm encouraged by also just in the world as I've seen, you know, every time someone is killed at the hands of the police or even a civilian, um, a black person is killed in that manner, it's always, um, upsetting in the black community. It seems like honestly for the first time it's now upsetting for other communities that are not black and I think that that is what is I hate that this is the place that we're in but I'm encouraged that people other people are now getting upset too and realizing how unacceptable it is and so I'm hopeful that that feeling of being upset um, stays with everyone actually stays with everyone until we're in a different place. I think being uncomfortable is how this gets better because we've been uncomfortable <laughs> for a long time. Um, but uh, I think if other people consistently stay uncomfortable until we're all in the same place in, in a better place, then I think that's how change happens. So I'm, I'm encouraged and uplifted by you all participating today. Thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, and for folks who can join us later this week, uh, I look forward to seeing you all. Uh, but I am always accessible. So one-on-one -on -one conversations, group dialogue, um, anything. Please feel welcome to reach out. Also, thank you. And I put all of our links for Elena, myself, and Emily for our uh, Hopkins site. So you can email us and connect with us separately if you want to as well. Um, but definitely keep in touch with us. Let's continue the conversation.